true honor to be back here. Um, get a mentioned. My first show ever was at the CPA in 2005, so it's like coming home, and I'm so honored to be here and had been championed by Robin, who is the sweetest lady, I have to say. I really enjoyed getting to know her, and she's so passionate about the CPA. It's a, a really wonderful experience. And Gitta, who has been a friend of mine since about 2009, right, when I met you at Beth Moon, and I had a show together. I'm very honored for you to be here, Beth. Thank you. Um, so... Some photographers uh, shoot the world they experience outside of themselves, and some photographers shoot what they experience within. I would be of the latter. I never planned on being an artist. I think when I wanted to be a great writer or actress when I was a little kid growing up, but my journey began at the age of four when I experienced a severe trauma that was so life-altering that I subsequently experienced night traumas. I mean, night terrors. My brain's in somewhere la-la land. I'm sleeping right now, you guys, so, <laughs> you know. I uh, took a little help last night of a sleeping pill, and my brain's a little slow. But um, when I was uh, four years old, um, I witnessed something that nobody should really ever witness in their lifetime, and the result was these night terrors. And if you don't know what they are, they're extreme uh, uh, nightmares where you don't, you can't wake yourself out of them, and nobody can really wake your, wake you out of them until you wake up. And they're just terrifying. And I. Um, couldn't cope with them and my parents couldn't cope with them but my mother came to the idea she was an artist and a musician and very creative person and she came up with the idea of teaching me to draw and paint my nightmares at the age of what really started uh, proficiently around six when I moved from South Florida to Chicago um, and so every day that I'd have these nightmares, my mom would sit down at the kitchen table with me and we'd create um, a piece of art about my nightmares. And whether it was sculpting or drawing or painting or whatever it was, um, that process really stuck for me. It was the only thing that really helped me out of these traumas. And I did that throughout my childhood because they never really went away throughout my childhood. And um, somewhere, she would always introduce me into different art forms. And around eight years old, she introduced me to photography. She was a little bit of a hobbyist, and she collected crazy vintage cameras. And she had a, a lot of really bad brownies and Polaroid SX-70s. And she had this one little camera, this um, Pentex 110. You all remember those things? The horrible cameras take terrible pictures. But she'd always keep it in the bottom of her purse, and she'd go everywhere with it. And she also kept like screwdrivers and all these crazy things in the bottom of her purse. So they would like rub up against the camera. And these, the optics were absolutely atrocious. But she would always hand me this camera and just say, go shoot or shoot this. And from the first roll of film that came out of that camera, she just looked at me and said, you're going to be a photographer. And it stuck. And um, it's, it's been my passion since eight. So as Gitta said, I, uh, I started in the dark room at actually 11, <laughs> but my dad built me a dark room right next to his workstation in the basement. So I had to listen to his saws going as I would be in the dark room. And, um, and I was in love with that dark room. I just never left that dark room for, for till I was 19. I think I was just in there all the time and started working for a commercial photographer at 14. And I was just so immersed in this, this world of photography. I just, that's all I wanted to do and say and think, but burnt out, way burnt out by the time I got to college. So I started studying entertainment and that life sort of fell behind until my mother uh, was tragic, tragically died when I was in my 30s and the night terrors came back with a vengeance. Um, I didn't know what to do with this situation except for honor my mother by going back and photographing my dreams and nightmares because that was my art, art of choice, is photography. Um, meanwhile, I hadn't 
picked up a camera in 10 years in between this period because I was in the Hollywood world at that time. But I started photographing with every camera I could find and nothing looked like my experience when I was dreaming. I tried four by fives, I tried everything until my ex-boyfriend gave me a Holga. And something, I looked at this Holga and I started looking at the, the effects of the Holga and I'm like, well, there's something here. There's something here, but it's not doing exactly what I want to do. So I started pulling apart the Holga and rebuilding it because my dad was actually uh, an engineer and inventor at one point of his life. And he taught us that if something didn't exist, you just built it. So I did. Um, so I'd pull apart this, this uh, whole gun, rebuilt it, make it do telephotos, close-ups, all kinds of different things. And I really enjoyed it, but I kind of grew bored of that because it was just no matter what I did, it still looked like a toy camera image. It didn't look like my, my subconscious world and what I was trying to work out. So I brought this problem to my father, and I said, what should I do? And he said, well, why don't you just build something? Okay. <laughs> so it took me about a year to teach myself how to build cameras by pulling apart hogas and rebuilding them all the time obsessively until finally I decided I wanted not a holga, but something that was very unique to itself. This is my first prototype of my homemade cameras. Now my homemade cameras are 100% homemade. This one had some um, found parts, some vintage parts in it until I taught myself to, how to build shutters and things like that. Um, this one was the first one. Uh, this would be Johnny Cash. I uh, <laughs> named my cameras after famous musicians and there's Johnny is my most beloved uh, next to Coco Taylor, John Lee Hooker, my latest is uh, Jack White. If y'all know who Jack White is, I'm obsessed with him. So I had to have a camera just next to me that na was named Jack White. <laughs> you know, um, so these cameras are are only one to three shutter speeds, much like toy cameras, and very inaccurate. They have one aperture. I make them mostly the the lenses are molded out of hobby plastic. And the garbage, I use garbage bags for bellows. There's rubber around there. As you see, a lot of black tape because I am constantly just sticking these things back together. They break all the time in the, the field. I have to carry about three of them with me wherever I go because they have different abilities. And um, they're the ugliest things you've ever seen, aren't they? <laughs> you know, but they just yield amazing effects. And um, so my first test image was Blue's nose. And this is my late baby um, who just passed away last July um, and this is the image that ended up in the CPA show in 2005 and I had just I had shot it in like March of 2005 put it on a blog and everybody's like wow that's you got something there there's something to that camera that you're doing and um, and it just sudden it suddenly got me all these places I don't just this one image and um, I realized I loved the effect, but I didn't know how to pull it all together. So I started trying to work with this in um, what I would do is I'd journal my dreams every day and then go out and try to shoot them. So this is March of 2005, and it didn't really come together until June of 2005 when I was visiting London right before the bomb blasts, only a few days before I shot this image in Paddington Station. And I had a specific dream about being in the underground and a train station. And I went and I shot this. And of course, I can't ever stand looking at my stuff in JPEG form. So you're going to have to look at this in print because it's a whole different experience. Because stuff doesn't really translate in JPEG, I think. But, um, but this opened up a door of the process was really starting to work for me. And how I was interpreting my dreams and my traumas into the... Um, the film that I use. I use, oh, by the way, I use medium format film. You want to know, I use FP4 and Imperceptal. Everybody asks that. Um, and so this was the first one. And then I just kept on shooting. I had a really prolific time between 2005 and 2007 to um, begin the first chapter of Within Shadows, which is called On Waking Dreams. And this particular image is one of the only images that I have that I could tell you that is exactly what I dreamed. Sometimes I, I will um, 
photograph symbols or metaphors and then sometimes I will actually photograph what I saw in my dream this is actually what I saw unfortunately it was only 20 minutes from my house so the minute I woke up got in my car with my dog drove to the bridge took the shot just a few frames of the shot and went home and then developed the film the next day and I was like well okay <laughs> got it thank god and um, this went on to be a sort of a, a marquee image for me um, so I just kept on shooting and this is the last image that I shot in within shadows which got me my first gallery so I only had like 20 25 images and this strange thing happened where I was walking through photo LA and I bumped into a friend of well, a friend that I had not met before but just an email friend and his name is Dave Anderson and and I was so excited to meet him in person. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm your biggest fan. This is so exciting. And he's like, well, wait, I gotta, I've got to see your prints. And I only had, like like I said, 20 or 25 prints at the time. And I, he's like, well, let's go see your prints. And so we went out to my car, and I gave him and Alex off a trunk show of 20, <laughs> 25 prints. Actually, no, he wasn't there. I apologize. Alec was not there at that point. That was just Dave and... Um, somebody, a couple other photographers, but um, he saw these and he just wigged out. He's like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And he snuck my book into Photo LA, which is guys never do this. You are not supposed to do this. It's like the biggest faux pas. But um, Dave snuck my book in and brought it to one of his best-selling galleries, and she signed me in after seeing like two prints. So this started this crazy. Um, journey that I just didn't know was coming because I had no idea I didn't even know what a fine art photographer was I was just doing this for myself I the only kind of photographer I knew was like documentary and editorial and so it, it, when Dave got me into galleries I'm like oh I don't know what I'm supposed to do and I had to just sort of learn everything on the fly and I also had to keep making work and there was so much pressure to come out with more work when it wasn't just for myself anymore so I sort of had to just put sort of teach myself not to pay attention to what everybody else was seeing or judging and and go on so um after i released the this first body of work i started working on a second body of work um second chapter i should say of within shadows which was called between and i wanted to do a little something different with that chapter and that was and ca sort of capture the emotion that i was waking up with and I think this is probably the most successful image of that 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 chapter, and this is called Suspend. So each image in that chapter, the title will correspond to the emotion that I woke up with. And this is the only time that I worked with people that I knew. Like everything I usually capture is random. Um, I don't know the people and. But for this chapter, I would call my friends up at like 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, and either they'd hang up on me, or they'd say, yeah, I'll go out with you. And so um, that was just about 10 or 12 images that I made like that. Now, this particular image was in that chapter, and it's probably one of the more profound images for me because it is really the reoccurring nightmare that I have all the time, and it's about the closest thing I could come up with or have succeeded to come up with that... Um, that tells you what I'm dealing with basically in my subconscious and that one's called yearn so after this is the image that is actually for um that I donated that you guys can bid on um but um after I finished between I went into a chapter called flight and it was all about stepping out of my dreams or trying to wake up from my dreams and this started that chapter and what happened during that, I think there's like 15 or so images in that chapter. What happened during that towards the end is I took this trip to New York and it was a really profound trip for me because it led me to the next body of work. Um, and these are two of my most popular images that I shot in November of 2008. That, particular, that image on the left is probably one of my most popular ones. It's called In the Mist. And I shot it at Mulman Rink and I was out there for hours waiting for the right moment and those are that's actually two people spinning um together and it just I took only a few frames but when I saw that it was just the happiest moment of my life <laughs> that I like nailed it um so anyway this 
these two images led me to a lot of work, uh, my ne next body of work pretty much, um, which ended up in New York, a lot of it. And the reason why, um, after I ended that Within Channels in 2009, I think right when I ended it, my, my dad had a stroke. And uh, it was a really difficult time in my life because this, my father was a former football player, big, strong man, could conquer the world, basically, and had to help him. He lost control of his right side completely, and he ended up passing away in six months. And it was a really, a really difficult time, and it made me realize that I was completely alone in the world, basically, because I had no more family, pretty much. Um, and so every time somebody dies in my life, my night terrors come back. And when my dad died, my terrors were very different from when my mom died. And they were far away. The perspective changes, basically, in my consciousness, in my subconsciousness and my conscious when I'm taking these pictures. So you'll see everything like you. There's always some kind of human form or human presence but everything's very small, and that represents basically what I'm feeling and, and what I'm dreaming right now. Um, this image, I think, is probably my favorite image at this point. It's called The Last Goodbye. Um, and I was telling y'all, er, the Dawson's earlier, um, this is probably the most technically challenging image I've taken, and, and I look at it, and I just want to cry because I just... You know, you, when you do something and you just wanted it so bad and then you have it up there. Um, what you see swirling is actually rain. Uh, I was swirling the um, lens around to make that effect. And it was a very difficult challenge and, and to swirl that and keep the rest in focus. If you look below the arches right there, you'll see two f uh, a, a figure of a a person jumping over a, p a puddle with an umbrella, and then there's their shadow reflected. Um, as I was telling y'all earlier, I didn't know that that was there when I shot it, and this is the crazy thing about subconscious, how it works. My very favorite picture in the world is Henry Brisson's picture of the gentleman jumping over the, the puddle, and it showed up in my picture. So <laughs> I thought, think that's really cool when that happens, you know. So, um, yeah, so that's, um, this body of work has um, been a very challenging one because it's a lot about being a fish out of water. So uh, I can't really shoot a lot of these of where I live because I'm not a fish out of water, but I have shot some successfully, just a few. So I have to travel a lot for this, and I don't travel all that much with, now that I have this crazy puppy, I have to train her obsessively so I'm not it's it's a slower series that's coming to light so I started in 2010 I'm still in you know 25 images in only but I don't I, I edit so meticulously that I'll only let out the ones that really are saying what I need to say so the I'm going to show you just the last few images on here are images that um are my latest images that I shot. I shot this in the spring in New York, um, in Chinatown. And um, I'll just show you the last few. I just shot that last month at Ghost Ranch. And I've always been obsessed with Ghost Ranch, and I never had been there, but just the word Ghost Ranch was like, oh, that's so cool. But um, I had to wait forever to get that little car to pass by and get the light right and everything. But um, I think this one really encapsulates what I'm trying to say with this body of work a lot more efficiently than a lot of my images. But um, uh just that one solo cloud that just pops up out of nowhere. And a gentleman who this afternoon said something quite profound about the work, and he said, where are you? Are you here? The, the, what did you say again? You have to say that out loud, because it was so brilliant. You're finding the light in the dark. Yes, which is exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> um, because a lot of... Um, 
uh, my work is really about finding are you going to go forward are you going to go back are you going to go towards the light are you going to go towards the dark and I try to communicate that in my images with darkness and lightness playing off of each other um so I think that's all I have to say almost (laughs) okay thank you (laughs) 